I'll get started now, just with a quick introduction. We'll let people join in then. Uh, um, my name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Uh, Consolidon yeah. is new age in that it's... Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, Consolidon is new age in that... Um, anyway, anyway. Give me a second. Sorry. Uh, Elsa, you'll just have to mute everyone on entry, please. Yeah. Uh, ah, thank you for that. Okay, so Consolidon is new age in that rather than a traditional consulting firm that hires a lot of consultants and then uh, puts them on client projects or staffs them on client projects, we took a different approach. We decided to partner with lots of boutique consulting firms, individual subject matter experts who set up their own consulting firm, firms or larger, slightly larger niche consulting firms. Um, this model allowed us to scale very quickly. Uh, we started operations in 2017. By the end of uh, 2000, uh, by the end of 2019, we had about 500 consultants to choose from. We'd already delivered almost 200 consulting projects across the GCC region. Um, we uh, 2020 was supposed to be a really really good year for us. Uh, unfortunately like for most others, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, we decided in 2020, you know, after we recovered from the initial shock, March and April, after the, after the lockdowns, we decided that we're going to spend at least 20% of our time. So me and my colleagues, we spent almost 20% of our time on getting things, uh, getting organizations, other organizations back on track. We started off, for example, a project last year called the Superheroes Project, where we got about um, uh, 700 business leaders across the GCC to help small businesses and micro businesses get back on track. This year, we decided that perhaps we'll, uh, we will also try and help larger organizations. Uh, so we spoke to the boutique consulting firms in our ecosystem, about 70 of the boutique firms uh, and us together set up a web summit, a seven day web summit called Connected Insights. So this workshop is a part of the Connected Insights web summit where uh, you know we're doing about 50 panel discussions and uh, webinars and six workshops. So this is day four of Connected Insights and our third workshop, which is led by uh, my good friend, uh, John. Uh, I met John about, about a year back, uh, maybe more like a year and a half. Uh, we were supposed to do this. What's interesting is we were supposed to do this workshop um, in person in Dubai in April, which sort of picked April or May. And then of course the lockdowns happened, et cetera. So we decided let's do it now uh, and let's do it virtually. So it's a shorter version of that workshop uh, tailored of course uh, for online. Uh, so uh, just one quick housekeeping point is uh, we'd love for you to be present in video on this workshop because this will be a much more uh, valuable workshop for you if there's more interaction and if uh, John is and, and we are all speaking with each other uh, and if it's possible uh, could you turn on your videos for at least a short period of time uh, during the initial parts of the discussion uh, and uh, feel free to uh, let it uh, be on for the rest of the workshop as well. Um, so that's, uh, and of course, stay on mute uh, if that's all right, but feel free to unmute yourself and interact during the discussion. Um, that's about it from me. Um, John, I'm really looking forward to this workshop. Uh, handing over to you now. Thank you, Varun. Uh, well, welcome, it's nice to, um see a lot of faces I don't know, but actually quite a few faces I do know. So um, it's a, a great privilege that you've all decided to, to listen to me for the next uh, next three hours. Um, I, I have um, some notes, uh, so I may well um, be referring to those. Um, the, doing uh, these things over Zoom is very different from actually standing up in front of people. So. Uh, because normally you can get interaction from an audience, but um, um, but let, let's crack on and, and see how we get on. Uh, it would be good if this was interactive. Um, so if you feel that you need to ask questions, 
um, please do. Um, if there's lots of questions, we, we may have to do a bit of time management. Um, there, there are four sections to this, um, and my intention is to <laughs> try and split those evenly and have a, a five minute gap in between each section. Um, and with it, in that gap, we'll be asking you um, a question to have a think about. So you, you've got a gap where you can go and get a drink um, or you can um, and you can think about that whilst you, um, whilst you, whilst you have a bit of a, bit of a break. Um, so uh, just a bit of background about me and how I got sort of incredibly interested in this topic. Um, I, um, so I, I'm a businessman entrepreneur um, and I spent about 30 years uh, initially doing a sort of startup with no money and building it up to a, to a certain size and ultimately sort of buying, selling companies um, and um, sort of working at, at a higher level. Um, and I, I would describe that my career was in two, two phases. So, I mean, I've been doing that. You can see I've got grey hair. I've been doing that for about 30 years. Um, I, would, I would say that my career in that respect was in two phases. Um, the first part, uh, I think I was the, the sort of standard entrepreneur. So I was incredibly stressed. Um, I was working all the hours under the sun. Um, you know, I was probably drinking a bit too much. I was drinking 15 cups of coffee a day, um, always traveling. Um, you, you know, I sort of drive four hours there, four hours back to a meeting. Um, and, you know, I think that's fairly standard amongst entrepreneurs. And, I, you know, I probably wasn't, a, you know, I had a wife, kids, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I probably wasn't a very nice person, really. And then, then I got to the point where I kind of, um, I think, I had a bit of a burnout so and actually I met Tom, uh, Tom who spoke earlier um, on a selection weekend for um, a, a North Pole expedition. Um, so so I, can't, I, I kind of got in a lot of, into um, a lot of outdoor adventuring um, I, in inverted commas I was a polar explorer so I spent a lot of time up on the ice caps on expeditions. Um, after I came back, uh, I, I looked at things incredibly differently. Um, and I, so I applied all the knowledge that I'd learned, um, actually just really looking after myself in those sort of harsh environments to business and it had a dramatic effect. But the thing that got me wondering about um, decision-making um, was an experience I had, and I, I won't go into the story, um, that I, I've written a book which, which we'll tell you about, but, um, and, and that will explain a bit more about the situation. But I ended up um, on the green and ice cap, on my hands and knees, on all fours, um, and I was looked over to my left, and there was a polar bear on his hands, well, obviously on his hands and knees, on his paws, staring at me um, about three meters away. Um, so, so, I mean, I get, we've all been in those kind of life and death situations, haven't we? Where, I mean, you, you, you know, you almost walk under a bus or you're, you're painting the, the, the house and the ladder slips or so, so, so I don't think that was unique, but um, what I felt was unique was what I chose to do um, in front of that polar bear. And it, and it certainly wasn't the right thing. Um, so, so when you're in those sort of circumstances, you're completely on remote control. You know, you're, you're on autopilot. No one's, um, you're not making a logical decision. Um, time goes very slowly. Um, so, so what did I try and do? So I shouted at it, don't you effing uh, dare. So, so I tried, so, I, so basically there I was, life, death situation. I tried to tell it off. <laughs> what a ridiculous thing to try and do. Um, but and actually, I mean, it turned away and it went. It, it was in our camp, so it went and attacked another tent and everything. So I so I managed to survive. And that, but that wasn't for for anything, any logical decision making that I that, that that I'd done. And as when, when, once we came back and I started to think about that, I was really it started to make me really interested in what. Why do people make decisions? What's really going on in the head when they make decisions? Because in business, you're made, I mean, that to me was a life and death decision. I'm, I made entirely the wrong 
wrong choice of what to do. Um, and it was luck that saved me. But what was it that made me on autopilot try and tell a polar bear off that was three meters away from me? So, so when you're running a business or you're running a department in a business, you know, your, you might, your decisions might not be life and death, but they might be uh, existential um, decisions in terms of the in terms of your business so you might make a decision and your business might go bust or you might be if you're in sales you might be pitching for a contract and the decisions you make about people um, if you make the wrong decisions and the wrong judgment you don't win the contract um, and also in business that we're under so much stress these days and there are, there are physiological reasons why decision making which we'll go into is different when you're actually under stress that, that you're, you can often be in the same kind of circumstance that I was in when you're facing the polar bear um, when, when you're making a decision. So, so when I look back at my business life, I was thinking, you know, I've done all right, but my God, if I, you know, if I actually thought and understood how I made decisions and how un other people made decisions, um, how much easier life would be. Um, and I, I, I would describe the next once I finished that sort of period of adventure, which was about six years, I guess, and I, I kind of got back into standard business life. I think my, all the things I did after that, um, honestly, my life was a lot easier. I made more money. Um, I didn't have to work so hard um, because I kind of learned to apply what I was thinking to, um, to my business decision making. So, 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 so that's the framework of why I, why I got interested in all of this. Um, so I, I think the key thing to say is that what I realize is that most of us, we're on autopilot most of the time. So we think we're sort of making all these amazing uh, decisions about things and working hard on this that, and the other. But actually, we're literally on autopilot. The decisions that we make are rarely anything to do with our conscious thought. Um, so, so how... How are we going to look at things in this uh, in the next um, two and three quarter hours now is is basically in four sections. So the first one is to look at the impact of um, of our sort of pre-programmed beliefs on our decision making. Um, secondly, is to look at look at sort of how you feel about yourself and your success and how that imposes itself on decision making. Uh, a key thing is to look at how you change things because actually change um particularly as you get older uh is incredibly difficult and it actually hurts um but if you want to change your outcomes you have to change your 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 decision making if you do what you always did you get what you always got uh, and then um if we have time we can we can start to look at how we apply that um on onto a business and uh, I mean, Axiom, which is my consultancy business, has put together um, a process um, for applying this kind of decision making to all the different aspects of your business. Uh, and, and we can look at that. Um, so, as I say, if you if you wish to ask questions, please do. Um, I'm going to uh, share some share some PowerPoint slides. I'm going to share my screen, but but, but that so that's basically the introduction and, and how I got on, how I got really interested in all of this. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, can can everyone see that? I'll take that as a yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank yeah. you. Um, so there's, I'm going to start this with a quote. Um, so I, you may or may not have heard of this guy, um, but there's a, a, a famous author called Victor E. Frankel, and he was um, a Holocaust survivor. So he was actually in uh, a concentration camp in the Second World War. Uh, and he managed to survive. Um, and he's written a number of books, and, and most of them are sort of philosophical, but and some of them are quite life changing. But he basically said in his book, in between stimulus and response, there is a gap. 
and in that gap lies our destiny and freedom. So, so what he's saying is when, you're, when you have to make a decision about something, um, there's the stimulus that comes in. Um, and you have a period of time to think about that. And then you make a response. And depending upon that response, depends upon the outcome that you'll get. Um, now, that gap might be a couple of seconds. It might be a month. Um, but every decision has that process. So some information comes into you as a human being. You make some kind of a judgment on it and how to respond to it. And then you respond. And depending upon your response, response depends upon the outcome that you'll get. So that, what we're really looking at now is what goes on in that gap, yeah? In that gap that you have time to think. So I, we've called this section beliefs and outcomes because it's really to do with, with your beliefs and how they actually manage your outcomes. So we're going to look at four things in this. So we're going to look at just briefly, uh, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but just briefly how our brain works and how our thoughts work, um, how we're programmed to react, um, look at conscious thought, because we see the world through conscious thought, but conscious thought doesn't really have too much to do with how we react to the world. And then look at the, the situation with stress, uh, because stress is now a massive problem uh, in decision making. So just to talk a bit about our brain and our thoughts, yeah. So, so the brain is divided into a number of different sections. And I mean, this is this is really sort of common Western thought. I know if you, you know, if you the, the Chinese medicine, um, probably if you're Buddhist, you 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 may believe that things work differently. But this is this is kind of like common Western scientific thought about how the brain works. So you've got the cerebellum, um, which is basically the reptilian brain, which um, uh, is just responsible for kind of keeping keeping you sort of going. Um, so, you know, you don't think about breathing, you just breathe, um, you know, you, you don't think about blood pumping around your system, that's just done automatically, and that's done from the cere cerebellum. So if you think about a computer, it's probably, I would describe it as the operating system. So it's the operating system that comes preloaded uh, when you buy the device and, and it makes sure everything, everything turned on and the hard drives accessed, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why it's often called the reptilian brain. So then we have the, the limbic system, which is the part of the brain um, that's more sophisticated um, uh, in, in human beings. Um, and that's where uh, things like uh, emotion, motivation, long-term memory and repetition um, are, are, are derived from. And then, there's the neocortex, which is 76% of the brain. Um, and the neocortex is really what scientists believe make us uh, human beings. They make us, it makes us different from animals. Um, so you have things like perception and cognition, um, language. Um, and the, the neocortex is basically has four nodes. And there's only one of those nodes is... Um, uh, responsible for conscious thought. Yeah, so only the frontal lobe is actually involved in conscious thought. So if you go back to the limbic system, you can think of that as kind of like the database in the computer. And then the, um, the frontal lobe is the, is the application in the app, if you like. And the, uh, sorry, the, the neocortex is the application in the app. And the frontal lobe is the user interface. So that's how um, you see the world through your, through your conscious thoughts. But it's interesting that only a very, very, very small part of the brain is dedicated to conscious thought. And that's, that's worth considering when we're considering thinking about what the brain's doing to impact our outcomes. Yeah. So the human being on average has about 60,000 thoughts a day. 
Um, so that's two and a half thousand an hour. So if you think about it, that's like a sort of white noise of of um, thoughts going through our head all the time. I don't know, do I? Um, my coffee's not sweet enough. Um, uh, shall I? Shall I go to the gym today? Um, what shall I have for lunch? Um, um, I think I'll turn the television over. You know, I mean, uh, but there are sixty thousand of those thoughts flying through your head every day. So that's two and a half thousand an hour. Um, but only a small amount of our brain is used in conscious thought. And one of the one of the real issues in decision making is when um, when you are under stress, blood moves away from the frontal lobe um, into the back of the brain. So the more stress you're under, the less the less you're using conscious thought in your decision making, and that's what that facility drives everyone onto autopilot most of the time when they're making a difficult decision. So, so when we're making a decision, how are we actually programmed to react? What, what, what goes on when we're actually making a decision? So the cerebellum, as we've discussed, it, it becomes preloaded with all the commands to to support life basically yeah um so if you if you had a human being that was just operating off their cerebellum they would it, it would mimic some of the sort of AI that we, um, uh, could, uh, that's better thank you um the so so if, if when, when you see a, a ai operating um it pretty much mimics the reptilian brain function. Yeah? No, no AI has a character, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's just, um, it's just basically mimicking uh, functions, making things happen. So, so if you met a person that was only operating from their cerebellum, it would be very much like meeting um, some kind of AI today. Yeah? But, but in terms of reaction, uh, any, um, if there's something uh that's about if a car's about to hit you it's a cerebellum that basically makes the decision that you jump out of the way you don't think about it you just jump out of the way yeah. but it would be if anything were just a cerebellum it would be difficult to describe that person as human so so what actually makes us human as human beings so so I think it's it's fair to say that every person is born with a character. I mean, if you've got children, even after a day, those children have some kind of uh, character. Or I think all parents will say that. So there's something in us that, that comes from somewhere um, that actually starts to build um, a character. And, you know, I mean, I think religious leaders, spiritual thinkers, scientists, philosophers, authors, poets, filmmakers, children, Adults. In fact, everybody on the planet has probably at some point wondered where that comes from. Um, and I mean, for me, I think you just have to say, well, we don't know. Um, but we do have to accept that there's something that um, is innate in, our, in what makes us a human being that we, we can't really work out where it comes from, but it is actually there. And then the next seven years are incredibly important. So it was Aristotle and a number of other people have been, um, have been, had this quote um, uh, given to them. Um, but Aristotle said, give me a child and see the age of seven and I'll show you the man. Uh, now, obviously in this day, no, that's quite sexist, isn't it? But so give me a child to the age of seven and I will show you the person. Um, but it's in this early, the first seven years of life uh, that most of our learning um, is actually happening. And our brain is actually different in terms of its ability to absorb information. Um, but what that means is that we become the result of the environment in which we're raised. Um, so the programming carries on through our lives, but it's basically, it's, the, it's pretty much the first seven years of our life where all of our fundamental beliefs uh, are programmed into our in, into our brains, and I mean all sorts of people have used that. So I mean Hitler 
um, uh, had the hit with youth. Um, the Egyptians trained Christians to be Janissaries, who uh, um, uh, warriors effectively. Um, but all sorts of people and organizations, the Jesuits, uh, the Jesuit church um, basically used to go out and try and indoctrinate um, people in other countries by taking their children and indoctrinating them in, in Catholicism. So, so many societies have actually worked this out, that basically your fundamental drivers as a human being are really developed at the age of seven. I mean, that's quite frightening. So, you know, if you're going for, a, let's say you're going for a job interview and somebody sort of asks you a difficult question and you, you know, you're pondering the answer, nine times out of 10, if you're under pressure, it's probably your seven-year-old self that's answering that question. Probably not your 30-year-old self, it's probably your seven-year-old self that's answering that question. So ju just to um, talk a bit about me and my uh, a, 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 an indoctrination, which is how I kind of works a lot of this stuff out. I mean, I was, um, I was brought up in the United Kingdom in a period of time when, um, when basically we were moving to quite a secular society, but I still... Um, you know, I still had lots of um, religious, um, uh, I mean, I review it as indoctrination, um, but a lot, a lot of religious uh, input into my life at a young age. So, so I, I um, personally don't believe in a God, um, but if I'm in trouble, I still pray. Um, and I, I, I had this sort of, I, I follow a Christian value system, um, and I sort of had this... Um, um to me ridiculous concept that you know if i'm bad uh, i might get judged and i might go i might go to hell um now i know logically that's just that to me that's crazy you know I and mean, if, if you believe that then i fully respect that but to, but to me that's crazy um but but the result of the first seven years of my my life has left that left that in my belief system and i, I think virtually everything else that you do in your life most things are actually imprinted in there in the first seven years so in your subconscious mind your learning is buried away um, and when you're making a decision you're referring to the subconscious you're not referring to the conscious mind you're actually referring into the subconscious which is why we feel comfortable when we make decisions on autopilot because we're not even thinking about it. It's our subconscious that's making that decision. And, and you know, if you move away from your value system, um, which is, which is pre-programmed, uh, and you get out of alignment with that, you, people actually start to feel discomfort and emotional pain. Um, I, I know that, I mean, I, I have a very, um, um, a very independent streak. And I know that if, if I'm, somebody tells me to do something, it actually hurts me. It, it actually, I, you know, I, I get a sort of feeling in my chest um, because that's sort of moving away from, from, uh, from my subconscious. There's completely no logic behind that, but that, that's how I feel. So I think it's overriding autopilot is very, very difficult for people. So whatever we put into our subconscious mind, we start to repeat and we start to get emotional about it and, it and ultimately it becomes a reality. And we'll go on to look at that with uh, what some other people have said about that uh, later on in the, in the workshop. So as we talked about conscious thoughts, 60,000 thoughts a day are just sort of flashing about in your head and they're really, really difficult to silence. And, you know, you people lay in bed at night with, they can't get to sleep because they've got thought after thought after thought flying through your head. And I think when you're in business, um, I mean, the experience I had uh, was that, you know, you take your problems to bed. Um, quite often you wake up at four in the morning and all these things are flashing about again. You don't get a resolution to them, um, but, but, you know, they're, they're definitely impacting you. 
And then, so uh, input will go in through your conscious mind, through all those thoughts, but then they start hitting your subconscious filters. Um, so every, um, every situation that you're faced with starts going through the subconscious filters that, you, that built up in your first few years of life, right? So, so thoughts aren't facts. Thoughts are, thoughts are sort of opinions that you're, um, that you've, um, that you, you've developed um, primarily in the first few years of your life, yeah? And so consequently, people see the same set of circumstances in a different way. So, so in, a, in um, the same way that people look at a, a picture and a painting on the wall, one person will go, oh, wow, that's fantastic. The other person will go, oh, I don't really like that. I mean, it's exactly the same picture. It's the same colors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. People, are, you get two different opinions. Some people like it, some people don't. But it's the same with um, a, set of, a set of facts. Um, so people will look at a set of facts and then they, that, that sort of logical cold information comes in through their filters um, and they come to an entirely different set of different conclusion about it. And it's actually quite interesting to, I often wonder how anybody ever agrees on anything um, because so, people have so, such different filters um, that everyone is looking at things in, a, in, in, in an entirely different way. So what else happens when we're making a decision? So, so the information has gone in, it's gone in through our conscious thought, it's gone in through, it's dropped down through our filters, but then, then our body is, um, well, as Deepak Chopra said, it's, uh, it's basically one big chemistry set. So there are thousands and thousands of different chemicals in our body. Some of the main ones are serotonin, which influence your sleep and your mood, uh, dopamine, which, um, uh, 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 is responsible for emotion, glutamate, which helps with learning, um, drug uh, chemicals that help with stress response, oxytocin, which is social bonding. It's called the love, the love uh, hormone because it literally floods your body with uh, fantastic warm feelings. I mean, there's literally thousands. And depending on what your chemical balance is, really depends on how you feel uh, and consequently what sort of decision you make. So we're starting to get layers. We're starting to get in, information input is coming in through conscious thought, which doesn't really help much. It's going in through all these different filters. And then the decision that we're making is also impacted by, by kind of how we feel and how our chemical balance is. Um, I mean, I, I know full well, I probably, you know, as a salesperson lost contracts because the CEO that day I know, and had breakfast and had a row with his wife and he felt really bad and and um, consequently had a bit of a downer on things. And then, you know, your, your contract goes out of the window. Um, so there's all those natural chemicals uh, involved. Also, um, there's a lot of research now into the human microbiome, which is basically the, the bacteria that we have in our body. And there, there's theories that there are 10 times as many bacteria as there are cells in the body. Um, in the gut, there's 15,000 different species. And though some of those species can secrete chemicals that change behavior. Um, so for example, craving for sugar is down to a bacteria that's in our gut that when it, that lives off sugar, that when it needs sugar, it secretes a chemical, which makes our brain crave sugar. So again, that is changing how you feel. So so how that is balanced is going to have an impact on decision making. And then you've got things like drugs, um, which we, which we all, we all take. Um, they may not be illegal drugs, but most people now um, are on some kind of prescription drug. Uh, um, people are loading up on caffeine. Um, people smoke. I mean, alcohol is a, is a big, um, yeah, you've got caffeine there, Tom. <laughs> Um, but people are literally loaded up on loaded up on this sort of stuff every day. And I mean, I can remember in the early stage of my career, I would probably drink 15 cups of caffeinated coffee a day. Now I would come to the office in the morning before I'd had a coffee and people would say, don't talk to a customer until you've had a couple of cups of coffee. 
um, because I I didn't notice it, but I just felt terrible. You know, I mean, the the addiction was um, um, was having a big influence. Um, so again, when you're making a decision, you have all this, all these sorts of things come into play. And then, you know, I mean, it's pro this is probably quite good actually because um, most. I think I think it probably shows that actually what I've spoken about is that making decisions um, are um, that they're not made by your conscious thoughts, yeah. And that's probably quite a good thing because communication, um, most of it is not verbal. Um, and I, I mean, actually, that that that's why things like Zoom are so unnatural because. Um, for human communication is not really carried out verbally. Um, you might be using it to state facts, et cetera, et cetera, but actually you're, you're making your decision on um, body language. Um, you're making a decision on whether somebody likes you or not, um, not on what they're saying. It's on how they uh, are physically um, in your presence. Um, you're making decisions uh, on whether you like somebody with uh, pheromones, I mean, there's plenty of research that says that basically uh, two, two human beings, when they get together and fall in love, a lot of that is pheromone based, that basically you really just like their smell. Um, you don't notice it, but you, but you like it. And then there's energy. Um, uh, I mean, my father had it. My father could walk into a room if there could be 50 people in a room. Uh, if he was in a good mood, everyone was in a good mood. If he was in a bad mood, within about a minute, everyone was fairly low. Um, and, and, and so, you know, humans are constantly picking up on all of this, um, on all of these unseen, unthought, unwritten um, influences. Um, so if you're making a decision based on whether the person over there likes you or not, you're, you're judging that not through conscious thought, you're judging it subconsciously through their body language. So I think the point of this last um, last section was that humans view the world through conscious thought. So that's how you look at the world, but it's, it's basically your subconscious beliefs that are in control. And just to talk a bit about stress. Um, so when we were hunter gatherers, we had relatively few stress events. Um, um, so and we'd be attacked by a saber-toothed tiger or something and your body would fill with all sorts of chemicals. You'd run, you'd survive um, good. Then you just sort of set about hunting and gathering again. Um, in, you know, all, the, all those chemicals would clear out of your body and you would be, um, you would live, I don't know, probably for the next five weeks without any stress whatsoever. Um, but in the last century, pe people started moving into, into cities, into factories, um, started living a, uh, an urban life. And in the last century, so probably about 1980 onwards, stress actually started becoming an illness uh, and started being recognised as an illness. Um, and now stress is actually never ending, particularly with the use of mobile phones. So we're constantly in threat mode. So, I mean, you, I mean, you've probably seen, uh, was it the social contract, the film that, basically where um, uh, the guys that were originally developing Facebook said, well, yeah, we're, I mean, we deliberately made it. So every time someone gets a post, there's a squirt of, of a hormone, um, which, which makes them want to do more. Um, so, so every time we look at an email, you're scrolling through Instagram. Uh, I mean, I scroll through Instagram in bed at night. I mean, how's that going to get you get you to sleep because every time you see a post from somebody you know you like you're getting a little squirt of hormone that keeps you wanting to do it so those we're now constantly under stress particularly in business and that's actually starting to give us a physiological change and that and even that reduces the ability to make objective decisions because if you remember i was talking about blood moving from your frontal lobe um, to the back of the brain when you're under stress. So we're getting to the point where we're consistently every day 
operating on autopilot. So as a summary for that section, most of our reaction to any situation is unconscious. Um, and actually in business, current management thinking has largely ignored that. So you can watch a million and one uh, business related, personally related YouTube videos, read books about it, um, about self-help and personal change, etc. But none of them focus on the fact that most reactions to any situation are unconscious. Uh, stress is becoming an increasingly part of day-to-day -day life for all of us. Um, our fundamental personalities, thus the way we react to things, are set in stone by the time we're about seven. Um, so if you want to change your outcomes, um, that's, what, that's the area you've got to address. It's, it's that, those fundamental personalities that are set in stone up to the age of seven are the things, if you want to change an outcome, that's what you've got to address. You've got to start changing those. Um, conscious thought is an absolutely terrible decision maker. And how you feel, so your internal chemical balance and your microbiome have a quite a big effect, but a totally invisible effect on our actions. I don't think many people realize that how they feel is just going to make them, it's going to make them make different decisions. And, and most of our decisions are heavily influenced by outside factors, such as what you eat. And you'll make different choices for the same set of decisions influenced by these factors. So you will make a different decision um, if you've got a hangover or if you haven't got a hangover. Um, I, I mean, I people who know me, I think Gordon's here on this trip. So he would, he would vets for the fact that I get hangry. So if I've not eaten, I don't even notice it, but I get really grumpy and miserable and I make terrible decisions. Um, about five years ago, I, um, I had a heart condition. Um, the first thing that happens was that they, they load you with loads of drugs to calm everything down. So they, they stuck me on beta blockers, um, blood pressure pills, statins, aspirins. And that literally changed my personality. And I couldn't, I, in terms of making a business decision, I couldn't get any optimism. You know, I couldn't, I, I just, I just wasn't the same me. If, you know, there was a set of facts, I wouldn't say, well, let's do that. I go, oh, no, I got very, very negative. And that was because I had all these drugs coursing around my system. Now, now how, many, how many business people are stuffed full of, um, full of all those sort of drugs? And they're not thinking that they're really changing their decision making, but they absolutely are. So what's the learning from this section? So it's outcomes, which is the result of a decision that you make. So you experience them in the conscious mind. So that's how you see what's happening, but they're actually defined in the unconscious. And you don't really understand that they are, but they are defined in the unconscious. And if you want to change those outcomes, you have to address that pre-programming of your belief system and all of the other unconscious influences that, that, that there are. So that's the end of that section. Um, what I suggest is um, it's quite difficult to be interactive. Um, but if we take five minutes, and maybe you can all think of a subconscious belief uh, that was imprinted when you were young, that's having an unwanted influence on your life today. That might be in business, it might be in personal life. But the, the key thing to do with all this, if, if you've not really done any work in this area, it's really, you really have to start to be honest because some, you know, you're facing, um, you may be facing some quite big demons here, um, but it's a subconscious belief. You've got to start thinking about um, things in your subconscious that might have been developed when you were young and it, that's having an unwanted influence on your life today. So if we take a five minute break, um, have a think about that and then um, also have a wander around um, 
I'm happy to answer questions if anyone's got any questions at the moment. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think, John, uh, from my perspective, uh, I'm feeling a bit depressed after this because, uh, you know, it, it, uh, according to you, then it will take a lot of hard work to change certain things uh, in us, right? Because if they've been ingrained in us since we were like seven, uh, it's probably very difficult for us to change them. I think you have to look at it that all the things that make you what you are today come from there as well. Absolutely. So it's not all negative. Um, but if you want to change, if you want to change things, then yeah, you have to do, you have to do some hard work and it's hard work because, because personal change that's ingrained is very difficult. It's very difficult to change, but honestly, just the simple, the simple understanding of what's going on is transformative. Absolutely. So you've given us a heavy question to think about. Uh, I think, are there any other questions uh, or should we just go ahead and take a break and come back in exactly five minutes? Okay, see you in exactly five minutes, everyone.
Um, John, before we begin, can we just take some of the questions from, from the chat? Yeah, sure. Uh, the first question is more around, will the deck be available to share after the session? Now, we normally share uh, recordings rather than the decks, but it's, uh, uh, you know, we will come back to you on that, if that's fine. Um, um, so Priyasha, uh, John is asking, how do we know what's affecting us from childhood? Um, well, I, I we'll go on to talk a little bit about that, but basically, um, if you, if you, in terms of a negative thing, if it, if you actually feel um, uncomfortable uh, in doing something, um, and that that's a that's an emotional feeling. It's not a logical feeling. If you so so, let's say you don't like talking to other people, um, and you feel you feel really scared about talking to other people. That's probably from something that's been instilled in you as a child. Um, I mean, I have thousands of examples of that. Uh, like my ex-wife was a very successful business person, um, but she couldn't stand up. And give a presentation so she ended up running um a um international um it company's operations she could only sit down and she's an attractive lady very intelligent she could only sit down and talk she couldn't stand up i mean she, she was literally so scared that she couldn't stand up now now probably everybody around this table think how how ludicrous is that um but that that sort of feeling of fear um if you if you push against that that's where you start to realize that you've got some subconscious beliefs that are really holding you back yeah um mohammed sabri and we're okay to take two or three questions right john or... yeah just yeah let's crack on yeah um so mohammed sabri is asking um is it really hard work uh, to do to do, to do the changes. Uh, I think it's more of a process to rebuild new beliefs through subconscious mind. Uh, what are your views? Um, I think it can be very hard work. Um, and I, I think it's a process, but you don't, honestly, 50% of it is just understanding. Just un, uh, understanding, you know, the, um, I don't know, in Western, I, I write about this in the book, in, in Western society, um, a lot of people struggle to enter a room with other people in it. And, and the reason for that is that they're thinking that everyone's thinking, oh, I, you know, I'm not worthy or they, they won't like me or I'm not wearing the right clothing. Um, but the moment you realise actually what's going on is that the other 50 people in the room, they're all thinking the same thing. Um, they're probably thinking that they might give you 10 seconds thought, uh, but then they're all thinking, oh, crikey, I want, they, uh, I'm not sure that person likes me or I might have their own clothes on or so, you know, that and just simply understanding that that's what's going on, you know, sh should make it a lot easier to enter the room the second time. By the time you've done it 20 times, you'll be absolutely fine. So, so yes, I think the really ingrained stuff might take some work, um, but just understanding how people are thinking and how you're thinking, I think really helps. Sure. Um, and Omar, do you want to share your comment uh, verbally or should I just read it out? Whichever you prefer, of course. Uh, and that's Omar Khodr. Okay, I'll read it out, he says. Uh, so essentially, John, uh, he's saying, and for everyone else as well, he's saying that in Islam, uh, there is an emphasis on teaching children prayer starting the age of seven, and then re-emphasize it when they become 10, so, uh, so that they take it more seriously. Uh, absolutely, I think a lot of religions, uh, you know, have found, like John, you were saying as well, uh, they figured this... Uh, out and they sort of ingrain it uh, from childhood, correct? Yeah, agreed. And I, I mean, I, I, I saw that comment in the chat and I, 
I think I think it's worth emphasising that that cultural issues um, are very very inbred, aren't they? Um, and, and and as we live in a much more international world, we're coming across, we're we're doing business with, we're friends with um, people from significantly different cultures. Um, and I, particularly in business, you have to be quite careful. Um, for example, I worked in Finland for a, a time and a, a guy that I worked with, I mean, I was brought up in London. So what, there's nine, nine million people. Um, this guy was brought up on an island with 15 people. Um, and he spoke fluent English. And, you know, for the life of me, I thought he was just like me. But of course, he didn't think like me at all. You know, when you're when you're brought up on an island, I think it's the age of eighteen, where there were fifteen people carving out a living, you're you're going to think very differently, aren't you, about about things? And, and I think that's just one illustration of how um, how, in terms of our, our decision making, in terms of various cultures, um, you really have to think about these things. Absolutely. And I saw someone raise a hand, uh, so we can quickly take that last question before we move on. Um, I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm so sorry, I don't remember who it was, so you might have to either raise your hand again or unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, uh, no worries, John. So should we move on to the next section then? Sure, okay, so I'm going to... Um... Share my screen again. Okay, so success, the S word. Um, how we feel about, um, particularly when we're in business as an entrepreneur um, or <clears throat> you're working in a, <clears throat> in a large company, running a department, um, or wherever you are, how you feel about yourself um, and whether you feel a success um, is actually very relevant into your decision-making process. So what we're going to talk about here is, um, I, guess, I guess, the reality of business, um, <clears throat> what the purpose of business is and, and whether you... Um, whether you feel a success or not, because I've met probably more, more successful business people who don't think they're successful. Um, I, I think more people, I, I've met a lot of people uh, in business and mostly they don't think they're successful. Although you'd look at their lives and you think, wow, you know, this person is a great success. Um, which is is quite interesting so the reality of business um it's an adventure um if you go into business uh it's it's not the equivalent of climbing a mountain but um uh it's not as physically dangerous um but it is it is an adventure so one of the things that I think I've found over the years, um, sort of entrepreneurs and business people, um, the best thing to have really is experience of life. Um, so I don't think you need an amazing degree. Um, there's plenty of business people who are dyslexic. Um, there's lots of people who have MBAs who are, I mean, they're, they're, they're not that good at business. I mean, I've paid a lot of people to get MBAs over the years. I don't think anyone I would have asked to run my company, it might have made them more efficient managers. Um, but having an MBA doesn't actually make you a great entrepreneur or business person. I think if you are a good business person and an entrepreneur with an MBA, I think that's very powerful. But, um, but to be successful in business, a lot of people can talk the talk, but few people can walk the walk. Um, it, it, it's quite a it is quite a tough place to be. And you know, if you if you uh, read Forbes magazine, um, they do all sorts of research into this sort of thing. But 
Um, these are fairly well-known statistics, but 50% of startups fail within the first five years. Um, and I think that's worldwide. And, uh, and actually, the, um, many people say that's 80 or 90%, but Forbes say it's 50%. Um, but then one in three companies will fail within the next 10 years. Um, and actually, just because the company gets to being a big size, um, doesn't mean to say it's going to be uh, successful because in the last 50 years, 80% of Fortune 500 companies have disappeared. So, so even, uh, I mean, it, even Jeff Bezos says it. He, he said, well, look, ultimately, Amazon will go bust. You know, we, every company has a cycle and ultimately it goes bust. So, so really, the reality of business is it's a, t it's a tough old place to be. But um, I mean, particularly in, in uh, uh, my culture, um, people are queuing up to take the risk. Um, and actually business and capitalism, to me, uh, many people would argue this is, is the natural way of being. I mean, you know, you go, you go um, into a market um, into, in Bangkok, um, you go to the city of London, you know, and you, and you, you try and tell anyone that, capitalism isn't the isn't the place to be uh, the capitalism isn't the natural way of, um, of basically running an economy i mean the chinese um, economy was completely moribund and then then xiaoping um, basically released the sort of capitalist um, ethos back into china and that was in the late 1980s and now they're you know they're vying for the us as, to be the most successful economy in the world um, so, so actually being in business and entrepreneurship to me is natural, um, which is why um, people just queue up to take the risk of being an entrepreneur. Um, but the, the thing to say about that is there's absolutely no safety net. Um, so if you go and work for a company, um, certainly in the Western economies, you know, it, you, you can be made redundant, you can get given redundancy money, there's um, benefits, they're not great, but um, you know, there's safety nets in society um, for absolutely everybody other than uh, people that are owning and running businesses. So there's no safety net. You don't have any rights. Um, no one will come to rescue you when things go wrong. Uh, I mean, I, I, I did all sorts of crazy things, went to all sorts of crazy places. Um, the, the most remote places on the planet. And we still have what you call an EPIRB, which is a device that if you get into serious trouble, um, you activate it and it sends a signal up to the satellites. And you know, nine times out of 10, somebody from some army somewhere, the, the Canadian army or the, um, will come in and fly in and rescue you. you know, so so you, you can take, you know, pe people are kind of interested in your survival, even in those remotest of places. Um, but if you're running a business, no one's interested in your, there's, there's no, no one that's going to try and save you if things are going wrong. Yeah. So it's probably about the most exposed place you can be. Yeah? So it's sink or swim. And most people, I think, find that pressure surprising and overwhelming when they, when people decide they want to start a business. When faced with those, when faced with those pressures, they find all that extremely overwhelming. But business is essential to society because basically business um, pays wages. Yeah? So you so you take a load of risks, you employ people. Um, and that puts money on people's into people's bank accounts, which pays for their mortgages, which puts roofs over their heads, put foods on the table. Uh, and then um, probably those businesses pay tax. Um, they pay, which pays for government services. It pays for defense. It pays for hospitals. Um, and, and even very small businesses, sort of one man bands um, and, and black market um, businesses that don't pay taxes that are under the radar um, they provide a living for absolutely everybody on the planet 
Um, most state enterprises actually are a, an a agglomeration of private enterprises that were um, started by somebody taking a risk and putting them together. Um, and and a, a, again, this is my philosophy, but state enterprises don't really run companies very well. You never see the state starting something. So, so business has an amazingly important purpose um, across the whole planet. It basically makes the world go round. Business and commerce makes the world go round. So basically, if you um, if you start a business or you work successfully in a business, you're a success. Um, you might you might even just start a one man band. Um, but you start paying taxes. I, I, um, I, I have this theory that everyone that, that starts a business and runs it for a year in any country should be given a medal by their government. Um, now, we all know that's not going to happen. Um, but um, everybody that works in a successful, thriving business is a success. Um, but mo many people don't believe that. So many people, they start a company and they've got one person in it. They've got five people a year later um, and they still think they're unsuccessful and they get very negative about it. And they you know, want to drive on. I've got to 20. I've got 20 people now, but I'm still unsuccessful. Um, I want bigger this. I want bigger that. Um, and that, there's a fundamental sort of subconscious belief um, that, that they're not that they're not successful. But. But what is success? I mean, success is a value judgment. Um, success is actually, a, success again is just a feeling. Um, but one thing that we seem to have built, particularly in the Western world, is that is people are very depressed and they feel very unsuccessful. And it's kind of like become an epidemic um, amongst um, people who are incredibly wealthy. You know, so, so depression and feeling unsuccessful is an epidemic in the materially wealthy in the developed world. Um, and I mean, there, there's lots of, um, I mean, if you read books by people like Steven Pinker, um, you know, there, there's all sorts of statistical evidence that the world is getting to be a better place every year. Every year that you live in it, there's less people in um, who are hungry, um, uh, you know, global poverty is being reduced. There's less child poverty. Um, people live longer. Um, I think it was Obama who said, if you had a choice of any year um, in any century to come and live in, you'd live now. Um, so we've got this sort of quandary between the fact that we're, the world is definitely getting to be a better place, but everyone's starting to get very depressed about it. And again, this is something to do with our subconscious belief system. So how do you feel a success? So Benjamin Hardy, who was a motivational speaker, he basically said success can only truly occur internally because it's actually based on emotion. So, so feeling successful is your relationship with yourself. And why is that important in decision making? Um, because actually, if you feel if you feel more successful about yourself, um, you're going to make more positive decisions. Um, if you feel if you feel more successful about yourself, um, you're going to push into may, maybe more risky situations, but you're more likely to get a better outcome with a with a positive view about your own self self perception and self persona. But that's doesn't matter what anyone else says. It's all about how you feel about yourself. So we've looked at the fact that most of our reaction to any situation is unconscious. I mean, again, again, feeling successful is um, is a, is an unconscious feeling. And I mean, this is this guy is quite interesting. So he. Um, 
he did some experiments actually back in the 1950s with rats. Um, and they, so they, so basically they um, had, I don't know, 50 rats and they were testing them for intelligence. And they put 25 rats in, a, um, in one pen, 25 rats in another. And they had them observed by 10 scientists in, uh, in the first pen and 10 scientists in the, in the second. And they, they basically asked the scientists in the first, in the first pen, the first uh, group of rats, um, that they should um, act as if those rats were super intelligent rats and that they, that they were all very successful rats and that they, would, um, that they were bound to really um, complete the exercises as highly intelligent rats. And then they, with the others, um, they said, right, now you've got to treat those rats as if they're not very clever. Um, they're not going to um, be able to solve the puzzles and be very, very negative towards them. So this is just rats, it's not humans. Um, but they, they actually discovered that with all these experiments on rats, the ones that were considered by the human evaluators to be clever performed much, much better than the ones that were considered by the human evaluators. Bear in mind these are rats were um, had much much worse outcomes and they called this the Pygmalion effect and, and I mean that they uh, and this guy Bob Rosenthal he's been developing this concept throughout his life there's obviously been a lot of difficulty in actually testing this out on humans because of the the consequences um, but they have actually conducted experiments on humans um, and they, I mean, they had to stop them because the, they took children um, and they were basically telling them that they were hopeless. Um, and these children were developing speaking disorders, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the children that were told that they were clever and successful um, were doing fantastically. So, so he's branded this the Pygmalion effect. And so if others think you have a high potential and you're a success, so will you. doesn't matter whether you are clever or not. You will think you are if others think you are. And your outcomes ultimately will be better. And then there's the opposite. is the golem effect. If others think you have a low potential or a failure, you will be as well. And your outcomes will be worse. Now, I mean, I think those experiments have dramatic um, implications in society. Uh, you know, and they kind of prove that if, if you're in a sort of social social class in your society, um, that people don't think um, uh, as good as another one, your your life and your outcomes are going to be worse. Um, and I, I mean, I think you can see that everywhere in the world. Um, but in terms of your own abilities and capabilities and feeling of success, you can actually invoke the Pygmalion effect on yourself. So just by thinking positively about the fact that you are a success, not looking negatively at everything, you will improve your outcomes. So just some tips to make you feel successful. So as we discover, the first thing is to understand that most of your thoughts and feelings exist in the unconscious. So you might need some help with this. Okay, so you might need some coaching, you might even need mindfulness. I mean, Var Varen said, asked the question about, you know, you're trying to change some really significant beliefs. Um, you know, if, if you do have um, and I've met many business people who really, really had problems in this area. Um, you know, you might need some kind of a coach, mindfulness. I've known people who have hypnosis that help, help with that. But you'll never feel a success if you live, if you don't live in congruence with your subconscious values and your subconscious feelings. Um, know how important that the role that you play as a business person. Um, as we've discussed, business people drive society. Um, it's what you do that actually pays for hospitals, schools, etc. 
Um, if, you, if you're an entrepreneur, um, I think this is, this is very key. It doesn't matter if you're like a, if you're a one man band or you run a sort of five person company, you're in like an elite club. And if you, if you entered into a room with, um, oh, I don't know, uh, Bill Gates, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, in the UK, uh, Alan Sugar, Richard Branson, you know, they may be running huge organizations, but you, but they will understand that you face the same issues that they've faced, uniquely face the same issues that they've faced. And that, that's the sort of club that you can't, you can't, you can't pay to join that club. So you should actually, as an entrepreneur, just relish um, being a member of that club. Try not to be influenced by your conscious thoughts. But that's, but as we discussed, conscious thought is a bad decision maker. So always think about what's going on in your, try and think about what's going on in your subconscious. Um, success is a feeling. And if you want to have a good feeling about it, keep healthy and manage stress. So, so the healthier we are, the more we feel, um, the more we feel positive about ourselves. So, so I gave, I literally gave up alcohol um, probably 20 years ago now. Um, now, now in the UK, your whole social world is derived by alcohol. Um, so I gave, gave up as alcohol. I wasn't an alcoholic, but you, you could see people whispering about, about you know, why is he giving out alcohol? Is an alcoholic? But I gave, I gave it up for fitness. And honestly, it's, it, it just transforms your, um, your feeling, your, just your feeling and your confidence about yourself. So, you know, I'm not advocating that if you, uh, you know, if you like a drink, but just keeping healthy actually transforms your feelings about yourself. And if you feel unsuccessful and you feel down about yourself, remember that feeling is created by your belief system and not your circumstances. So if you feel negative about yourself, then that that isn't reality that's just a feeling created by your belief system so thoughts aren't facts so just to summarize this section which i've gone through quite quickly because we we're running uh, running short of time so business is quite a dangerous pastime and the chances of survival are limited um it's actually quite likely that you're not trained for the journey ahead most people, when they go into business, don't have any formal qualifications or experience. You basically have to learn on the job. But if you do make a success of it, you'll have the satisfaction of doing one of the most important jobs in society. So to me, it's more important than being a doctor because it's business that pays for doctors. It's more important than being a teacher because it's business that pays for teachers. And your feelings of success will be nothing to do with your company or what you're doing. It's all about how you feel internally about yourself. So I think the learning from this section is, is no matter how you feel about yourself, by any measure, you're actually a success now. Just the, the mere fact that you're sitting, looking at a screen, watching this seminar means that in your life, you're successful. Um, so, you, so people need to cut themselves some slack and actually get the Pygmalion effect working, but working for themselves, because the more positive you feel about yourself, um, the better your outcomes will be. So this alone will improve your outcomes. Um, and I, I think when I did lots of those expeditions, when I, when I came back, um, from living in the Arctic in a tent for weeks on end. Um, you kind of walk through um, the airport feeling a bit taller. And when, you know, you go into the boardroom um, or you go into um, what you were, you'd have viewed as before a very difficult situation with sort of very, I don't know, senior business people, just somehow that, you know, the, the fact that you stand a bit taller and you feel a bit more confident actually changes your outcome. So in terms of having a more positive outcomes, then 
you have to start, you have to get yourself feeling that you're a success. So that's the end of that section, which, as I say, I did rush through a bit because um, so we could keep to the time agenda. But if we do the same thing as last time, I'll stop showing my screen. So, so I think I'd like to ask a question. Um, and the important thing here is be honest with yourself. Um, do you feel successful? And try and avoid the logical answer. Try and avoid the, oh yeah, I'm successful because I've got this amazing car outside or, you know, do, do you actually feel successful? And then think, why does your subconscious make you feel the way that you do? And I, I, if you start asking these questions properly, um, you can get some quite profound stuff coming here. I mean, it, it sounds a bit superficial, but if you really ask yourself about how you feel, do you feel successful and why, why you feel that, the conscious mind is very good at tricking you. Um, you know, find all sorts of excuses. So um, I don't know, why, why did you, uh, why, did, why didn't you, grow that year oh there was a recession well, it probably wasn't a recession it was something entirely differently but the conscious mind will start thinking all those sort of excuses are so you need to try and get rid of that and try and get into the subconscious and, and ask yourself do you feel uh, successful and, and how has the pygmalion effect influenced your outcomes because actually as we as we've discussed we're all um subject to the pygmalion effect i've been very lucky I, I you know i've lived in the uk as a um, entitled white anglo-saxon protestant um and in the uk you know we're, we're kind of like viewed as um uh that we're you're going to be successful um so so i've lived in an environment where the whole of society has kind of given me the privilege of um of, of being able to make something of myself and 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 you know, I mean, I'd never have thought that, but that, but that's a reality. Um, and uh, but there are people that live in our society that that, that aren't that don't have those privileges. Um, and I and I think that's the same in every society, uh, everywhere around the world. So so how's the Pygmalion effect influenced your outcomes? So it's two thirty, two thirty UK time. Um, so should we have another five minute break and um, ponder those questions, Varun? Absolutely. I think that would be a great idea. Thank you for that, John. Uh, very profound thoughts for sure. I'm sure you really enjoyed putting together this deck. <laughs> Give you a lot to think about. I, I would much prefer to be standing in front of everyone doing it though. Yes. Because you get in interaction, don't you? Absolutely. Perfect. So we five need minutes. exactly five minutes. Thank you, everyone.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'll just give everyone just about a minute and then we will get started. In the meantime, are there any questions, any thoughts, comments? Does anyone want to share the answer to one of the questions that you know you're thinking about in the break? I think, John, we can get started. I think it's been five minutes, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll share my screen again. Okay, I mean, this is um, where we look at how to make some change. Just excuse me, I open my window. Um, and I need to shut it before I start. Apologies. Okay, so change. So how to start transforming your business um now you kind of um understand how to how decisions are made okay the, the first thing to say is that change is incredibly difficult um because what what tends to happen when you're trying to change things is that your subconscious keeps pushing you back to your pre-programmed behavior um so actually to to make any substantial change it's hard work and it actually kind of hurts um, <clears throat> because, you know, in a, lot, in a lot of cases, you're, you know, you're pushing against some pretty ingrained, ingrained stuff. But what we're going to talk about here is culture um, because we're the focus of this um, workshop is, is businesses um, and businesses primarily uh, succeed or fail on culture. Um, so if you're if you want to change your business, uh, you have to somehow change your culture. So so how how to make those changes? We'll look a little bit at uh, a concept called radical transparency, which was put together by a guy called Ray Dalio, and then and then a few tips to help um, you as you're as you're trying to change. But I think the the thing to say um, about culture. Um, is that your, your company culture um, is dependent completely on you and your leadership team. Um, so a company's culture completely reflects uh, the, um, the, the nature of the people that run the business. Uh, and you can see that all the way up to companies like Apple, um, where the culture of the, the founder is, is still inherent, or the characteristics of the founder are still inherent in the company. Um, it, it kind of changed, once you get above 20 million turnover, it kind of changes because you get, you get a lot more structure, but you can, start to, you can start to get ancestral cultures in there where the culture still operates with the people uh, in, in the way that the people that used to run it run it which is why it's so difficult to change culture but but you know let's say you've got a business of up to 20 million turnover that company is you and it's good at all the things that you're good at and it's bad at all the things that you're bad at um, so if you want to change anything in your company in your culture um, you have to look at your true strengths and weaknesses um, and actually look at your business, you know, look at your business. So all the things that you're good at, your business will be good at. And all the things you're bad at, your business will be bad at. So as an example, um, if you've got a company that's run by um, somebody who is terrible with money, doesn't matter how much money that company earns, the company will be bad with money. Um, 
in in my experience, uh, I mean, I, I built up a business with a guy who he was like a genius software developer, um, <clears throat> but he didn't care anything about quality. Um, and he he was my partner. Um, and so that that part of the business, we had some amazing software products, but I, I mean, I was CEO, so I spent my whole life going around customers apologizing because we roll them out into these massive retail estates and the, the stuff wouldn't work. Um, and so even though we had, te- we had teams of testers, we had um, all sorts of quality assurance. I mean, he, he defined the culture of the business in development and, and basically, um, he didn't really care about quality uh, so we didn't have a quality product uh, i actually bought him out um one thing i would say about myself is that I, there's lots of things i'm good at but i've never had um an original innovative idea in my life um so once he went i set about making sure everything was rock solid and etc cetera, etc cetera. i bought in managers to do that but so then what what happened so we end up with a company um where the product never ever went wrong, but we had no innovation. So that became almost as big a problem for the business as the lack of quality. So, um, so you know, that, that's just one of my experiences around that. And I mean, I, I could tell you many more, but in my experience, your business is you and your leadership team. And, and, and that's, that's quite profound. And then if you go back down to looking at all of this stuff about the stuff that's going on in our subconscious. So, you know, the, it's the seven year you, <laughs> seven-year-old you that's defining whether your business is good good at something or not so obviously if you're good at things um then you stick with them but we all we all have problems we all have issues where we have problems um so again in my in my case i'm not innovative in my case i i um i I have to be completely independent. You know, that's a real weakness of mine. Um, but Henry Ford said, if you do what you've always done, you get what you always got, yeah? So if, if you need to change an outcome in some part of your business, um, you have to start addressing your own behavior in that area. Now, I know, I know how hard it is to change. I mean, I, I, I had a situation once again on an expedition um, where I was, um, I mean, I was so exhausted um, we, and we were miles away from camp and I could, just kept falling over in the snow, et cetera. And I, I mean, it, it was like minus 30 and I was trying to persuade these guys that we should stay, we, let, let's just stay out the night. I mean, we'd have all frozen to death. Um, and, but, you know, I couldn't get up. And there was a guy there who he basically, he, he just, kept getting me up and he was helping me along um he didn't have to do it he was risking his life i mean they could have all headed off back to camp but even in even then i can remember how difficult it was for me to personally accept his help i mean you know that's that's just madness i you know i would have died had it not been for him but i still every time he picked me up in the snow i still (laughs) You know, I can still I, I still remember the feeling of oh, you know, almost ignominy that this guy was helping me. Um, now that that just shows how difficult it is to change. You're even faced with life or death, but changing though changing those fundamental characteristics in you it, it is is incredibly difficult. But um, bearing in mind that the only the only thing in life that is actually um, ever going to happen is change uh, so you get your company to the point where it's a success if you, if you just sit sit on it it's you know ultimately you won't be a success because everything around you changes so somehow personal change has to happen because it's actually essential to um it's essential to your survival your business survival and your prosperity uh, but as we've seen to change our behavior we have to address the subconscious drivers that we have pre-programmed in our early years. So um, I'd just like to talk a bit about this guy. I mean, he, um, a question came up earlier on how, how to change. I mean, Bruce Lipton wrote a, he's written a number of books, but his, his main book is The Biology of Belief. Uh, and he's a, he's a sort of cell 
um, a scientist that works in uh, at the cellular level, um, and he um, ended up discovering that like positive thinking um, not only changes you psychologically, but it actually changes your cell your cell structures. Um, so if you think positively about things, um, you um, it actually changes you physiologically as well. So when you, when you think about that, about psychosomatic healing, um, uh, plenty of people talk about that, don't they? That if you, um, if you think positively, you can cure yourself. Um, he, he has kind of proven that. So I, I would advise, you know, get, get the biology of belief. It's an absolutely fascinating read. Um, but he, in terms of, obviously he's quite, um, thinking about how you change yourself uh, to get these positive thoughts because many people have negative thoughts and they're they're actually as far as he's concerned they're kidding themselves with their negative thoughts um so in terms of his view in terms of how you change I mean, I'll, I'll read this because it's quite fascinating he says the things that you like and come easily to you in your life uh, are there because you have a program that allows them to be there so your subconscious um your subconscious has a program that allows it to be there. In contrast, anything you have to work hard at, put a lot of effort into, or anything you have to struggle for to make happen is as a result of your programs not supporting that. So subconsciously, if you find it hard, things that you find hard um, are where you've got to change. And, and I mean, I, I see this all the time. I, I, I mean, I get involved in a lot of businesses these days. Um, and I mean, let, let the software industry. Um, now, the software industry is full of technish, technical people who will say, um, oh, we don't like salesmen. Um, and, you know, when, when asked why they're not making sales, they'll say something, oh, it's a recession or um, it was just bad luck. We got to this stage in the tender but. You know their their conscious mind will make all these excuses for why they're why they're um, why they're not being successful. But the facts are that um, you know you'll find that the, like the CEO of the business actually doesn't like meeting people um, and actually feels uncomfortable selling. So so he's always moving himself in a direction away from doing those things and, and finds it really uncomfortable. And, and you meet many software companies with great products. They're terrible at selling, um, and they, they, you know, they, and they won't even recruit people who are good at selling. You know, it's, um, and that's because they're. So to change that, they have to address that problem. You know, they have to address the CEO will have to address the problem that he doesn't like uh, dealing with people, uh, and you see that in all sorts of things, particularly with money. You know, you get lots of companies who um, you've got a CEO who's got a real status issue with. So he's got to go around in fast cars and um, fly first class, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that, that ends up driving a culture through the business, um, loading it with overheads, um, which is really difficult to change um, because the, this guy's got some kind of status issues with money. So, so if, if he ever wants to have a successful business, you have to, he has to address those areas or have somebody help him do it. Um, and then we have, um, so it's not really just me that's that's pushing this kind of philosophy. We've got the concept of radical transparency. So Ray Dalio um, has put this together. Now, he's a, an incredible guy. He started Bridgewater Associates um, with nothing. And I mean, he's now a, a billionaire, probably more than once over. Um, so, so we're both pushing the same things. Unfortunately, he's a billionaire and I'm not, but... Um, we, we both kind of talk from the same hymn sheet. Uh, he wrote a book called Principles of Life and Work. Um, and he basically, from a very early age, worked out that most people are really bad at looking at a situation and seeing what's really going on. Because they, they've actually got all this stuff going on through their heads, all these filters that we've spoken about. Um, so they're all making a decision on on yeah you know, and and they they're not looking at the reality of the situation um and in his company now they actually train people 
uh, they have like a training scheme um, to teach people how to look at things um, in what he calls radical transparency, which is really just objective reality. Yeah? So he's asking people to look, try and seek out the truth in the situation rather than an interpretation. And now, I mean, it's probably worth asking yourselves, how often do I seek the truth in the situation or how often do I interpret it? So a quote from him, embrace reality and deal with it. Truth or more precisely an accurate understanding of reality is the essential foundation for any good outcome. Um, and also he, he suggests you need to look to nature to learn how reality works. You must evolve or die because we're the only species that has all this stuff going on in our head. Um, you, you know, you don't, you don't meet a deer with an opinion. Um, you know, you meet a deer that knows that if that thing's chasing him and it runs fast on him, it's going to, it's going to bring him down and kill him and eat him. Um, and it's the human species that somehow has developed to have all this sort of questioning going on in our head. And then don't get hung up on how things should be. You will fail to see how they really are. And I'd ask you in your lives and, and how often have you said it's not fair? Um, you know, it's not fair that I didn't get that or, or, or it, it wasn't fair that we didn't win that contract or, you know, that you, you hear children talk like that. Um, and very often adults just extrapolate that behavior. They just make it look more sophisticated. So, so you might have wanted it to be a certain way, but you know, if, if you just want something, you'll fail to see how, you know, you'll fail to see the reality of it. So that, that's Ray Dalio, Bridgewater Associates. I, I would recommend actually um, getting one of his books and reading it because it's, um, it's fantastic. So, so how do we change outcomes? So the first thing is, so, you know, and this is sharpen your um, decision making, transform your business. So, so the first thing, and I mean, everyone's going to raise their eyebrows now, but create a better physical platform. Yeah. So, so you need to keep fitter. You need to eat cleaner. You need to reduce your drug intake, um, whatever drugs you're taking. Um, you need to reduce your stress. You need to get enough sleep but you need to be aware of the influence your physical circumstance has on your feelings. Now, I mean, if you eat seven, I think Varen eats seven buckets of KFC a, a, a week, don't you want a day, isn't it, Varen? Yeah, I mean, something like that. Yeah. So, so you don't need to cut it all out, just eat six. You know, I mean, that's going to that's gonna improve your life. If you, um, you don't need to cut out caffeine, um, if you have six cups a day, I only have three. Um, but incremental changes will all give you a better platform um, to make business decisions from. So remember what we said about the microbiome, the, the drugs, the um, chemical balance in your body, all the stress. You just need to give yourself a better, a better platform um, to, make, to help you make decisions. So you don't, have to you don't have to start with changing it, but you have to be aware of your subconscious habits and experiences. So, I, so I'm gonna illustrate, I mean, this is, a, I'm just gonna tell a, a bit of a story about an experience I had when I sold a company. Um, once you start thinking like this, you can start to, not only change your own decision making, but when you understand how others are making decisions, that 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 gives you a great strength, and you put yourself into a great a position of control. And I, I, about five or six years ago, I sold a company. Now the guy that the guy that bought this company, I got to know him, and I understood that he had a real thing about his father, um, and his father had been relatively successful but then was bought was bought out ended up with nothing um and and kind of died um it's quite a sad story but he so he was an entrepreneur that really failed um 
and uh, and died a really sad sad man because of it and so 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 this guy ceo of a of a business i was selling to he um I, I suddenly realized that basically all the time he was just trying to, he was making decisions for his father. He was trying to prove to everybody that, you know, he and his father could, um, you know, were, were, were actually really worthy. Um, and that you could see this driving this guy. So, I mean, I, I sold him, I sold him a company. Um, and, you know, I mean, they should never have bought this company. Um, but, and you know, so we sit and we do all the, uh, the. He'd make a presentation to the board. Oh, we should buy this because of the ROI. You know, the ROI is right, and yeah, there's great synergies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was ridiculous. He was buying that because he wanted to prove to everyone that he could buy the company for his dad. So, so that's now he he hadn't worked that one out. I'd worked it out, you know. Consequently. I mean, the, the reason that, why do people buy things? If you're in sales, I mean, it's not really ever around the products. It's normally about something to do with themselves. Um, but that's all in people's subconscious. But if you can understand what's going on in their subconscious, then it, it gives you a, give you a bit of an edge. If he'd have been aware of his subconscious habits and experiences, he would never have bought that company. Because obviously a couple of years later, it... Um, the, the, the reasons for the merger all sort of fell apart. 80% of all company mergers and acquisitions fail. And actually, when you think about that, um, why are people, why are people buying other companies? You know, probably 80% of the time it isn't because the, the synergies are there. It's probably for some other reason. You know, I used to sell IT, um, sort of big mainframe IT. Why, why do people buy IT? So they buy, they buy them for safety, that um, uh, career progression. Um, they don't buy them because they're the right product for them. And, and that's all to do with people's subconscious habits. So in terms of changing your business outcomes, I mean, this is a metaphor, but try and get above your business. I mean, you can do it in life. Try and get above your life. And, and take a look at where things aren't working for you. Don't ignore the ones that are working, but try and see where things aren't working for you. Just take a helicopter view, get clear all the mess, take a helicopter view, and then, then try and be absolutely ruthless. Use this Ray Dalio concept. So look for the, the objective truth. Don't look for an opinion. Try and look for the objective truth. Why, why, um, why am I bad at that? And what's the reality of why? Why, why did we lose that contract? Um, why, why does this group of people over here, why, why don't they want to work for me? Why, why are they producing bad results? And look at it objectively. Don't, try and get rid of this sort of emotional, um, uh, subjective reality and search for the objective truth. This is a good one. We all love this. So make a list of your areas of discomfort, yeah? And then put it on your desk and refer to it every morning. Because you, you always default to your comfort zone. You get into the office and you, you sit at your desk, behind your desk, and you start to default to your comfort zone, yeah? So if you don't, let's say you don't like talking to customers, write that down. I don't like talking to customers and diarize a call every day um, to a customer. Um, plenty of entrepreneurs feel, feel quite uncomfortable at what we call C-suite level. Um, so I don't know, you're running a company with 100 people, and you, <laughs> but you've got a contract with a business with 25,000 people. Um, somehow all this sort of status stuff comes in. Don't and a, a lot of entrepreneurs feel a bit sort of diminished by that. So, so if you feel uncomfortable at C-suite level, write that down and arrange meetings at C-suite level as often as you can. Now, if, if you think about it, if you if you're running a business, most, most companies lose, con, lose customers 
there's the, uh, I think Bain and company did some research on it. 85% of customer losses aren't down to a bad, bad um, product or, or uh, an unreliable product. They're down to um, the fact that um, you're not contacting them enough. You know, they, they, they kind of get to feel unloved. Um, and literally, you know, I mean, you, you can have a, ter- uh, you know, you could be delivering a terrible product, um, but you're, you know, you're in a relationship with the people trying to, in the customer trying to sort it out. Um, and so you have contact, but if you, if you don't, con- if, you, if you're running a business and you're not contacting that business, they, um, that, that's why they leave you. So if, if you have that problem, um, and you're not contacting um, decision makers, recommenders um, in your customer base, they don't think you're interested. So, so write that on your list and do it. So have a list of, uh, you've got 10 clients, uh, your top 10 clients that give you 80% of your business. Um, make sure that once a week, you have a meeting with their CEO or, or something. Imagine how transformative that is. If, if you're the sort of person that sticks their head in the sand when money problems come up, and, and, and that's actually amazing in common, look at financial reports every day. You, you, it, it, it fascinates me how many business people are actually don't like don't like money they don't like dealing with money they don't like looking at money um and and you know if you, if you don't like that you you know that's the lifeblood of the business isn't it so so put that on your list and make sure you make sure you look at the money situation every day you everybody has something that's blocking their success so, so everybody has something in their mind that they don't want to do, that when they get in the office in the morning or get behind their screen, they, they won't do, or they put off, or they put it to the bottom of their priority list. And those are the things that you need to be working on. Those are the things that, that are going to be, because you'll carry on doing the things that you're comfortable with. And actually, if you keep working on that, you might find that those areas where you're really uncomfortable are actually quite comfortable. And that should become a skill in the end. Um, well, this is a big word for making everyone feel uncomfortable, isn't it? Create constructive dissonance in yourself. So make yourself feel uncomfortable and make others feel uncomfortable because we're, we're all, you know, you might be running the business or you might be running your department. But actually, everyone likes getting in the office and having a nice, comfortable day, don't they? And they're all, they're all doing things that they're quite happy to do and ignoring the things that they're bad at. Um, one thing that's quite useful is to get somebody to review your progress on this. Um, so get a coach or a peer uh, to review your process and keep you on track to make, make sure that you keep doing it because it's, it is actually hard work. Um, co- co- I mean, I, I would prefer to use a peer uh, rather than a coach because coaches, you know, you probably have to pay. Um, and <clears throat> they quite often tend to try and um, they just want to keep their contract, don't they? So they're never going to make life too uncomfortable for you. Now, that, that's objective reality saying that. Um, but coaches are normally there not to um, help you, but they're normally there to make sure that their contract keeps going. So get a, it's better to get a peer to do it or maybe a coach that you trust. Um, if it starts being uncomfortable, push into it. I think Tom, who I can see here, Tom understands that concept because Tom's a rower. Um, so when it's really hurting, that's the time that you kick in um, because that's when, you, that's when you win the race or get the incremental increase in fitness. Um, but if it's hurting, it's actually working. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, it's working. That's where you should be. Um, 
if you've got more serious blockers, you might need to take a more radical approach. Um, so mindfulness, meditation, uh, you might even need to seek professional help. Um, I mean, I, the, the guy that I said that I sold that company to, I actually thought he was mentally ill. Um, I think that his, um, his decision-making was so flawed by his re past relationship. I, 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 th I thought that actually he probably needed, he needed help actually, which I did, which I, I told him. It didn't go down too well. But... but after you sold the company, John? Yeah, after I got the money in the bank. <laughs> Um, also, don't underestimate the massive impact that even a small change can have on your outcomes. Um, I don't know. Let, let, let's say, let's say you're, you know, you're under a load of pressure. You're married. You've got three kids. Um, you know, you you rarely see them. You know, that's gonna that's gonna add pressure to your life, isn't it? So, so, I don't know, work on a Saturday morning and take Wednesday afternoon off, pick the kids up from school, bath them, um, you know, just spend some time with them. You know, j just that one little thing would have a radical impact. I mean, certainly in part of my business career, that would have, if I'd have actually been mature enough to do that, that would have had a radical impact on my outcomes. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's, that's just a small thing, but... But we're, we're talking about incremental change here. Very small changes can move you in the right direction. Uh, learn to adapt. So no company can survive if your, if your values are outside of your, if your culture is outside of your leadership values. So you have to be able to adapt. And look at each situation, not in terms of how you feel it should be, but in terms of how it is. So again, getting back to this whole radical transparency. We all look at life through subjective filters that distort the facts. So try and get away from the, those, those filters. So in summary, um, culture is vital to any business. And basically it's you and your leadership team that define the culture. And in a bigger company, if you're running a department, you define the leader, the manager defines the culture in that department. The company or that department reflects all the good things about you and all of the bad things. Um, in order to change your outcomes, you actually have to change yourself. It's pointless trying to change other people you have to change yourself and then that will actually change your change your outcomes no one's going to do it for you and as we've constantly gone on about is your real beliefs reside in your subconscious and they may be visible to you this is an important one your conscious makes self your conscious self makes excuses and gives you compelling reasons for how you behave and it does that to avoid the pain of having to confront your beliefs. So your conscious mind is constantly trying to keep you comfortable. But by facing your beliefs, you can change them and probably you'll turn them into strengths. And some of the most successful business people in the world have worked this one out. And they realize that truth and honesty about yourself and the situations you find yourself in is the only way to succeed. So, so, so basically, all we're talking about here, the last couple of hours, has been about just be honest with yourself about things. And if you're honest with yourself about things, you can make some fantastic changes. And the learning in that is change is hard, but ultimately it's down to honesty with yourself about what really makes you react particularly when under pressure. And remember this whole thing about when under pressure, um, physiologically, you move onto autopilot. And you can put in place processes to affect change and make better decisions. And if it feels uncomfortable, it's working. So I'll come off share.
Um, so, yeah, okay, we're, we're doing well here. So it's 10 past three UK time. So if we've got five minutes, we'll have another five minute break and have a think about this question. Um, so think of a subconscious belief that you've had that adversely affects, impacts the culture of your business, your business team or work output. So think of a subconscious belief that you have that adversely impacts the culture of your business, team or work output. And then think how you can overcome it. Great. Thank you, John. See everyone in five minutes. Thank you.
Uh, does anybody have any questions, thoughts to share? Um, I have noted a few discussion points, but we don't necessarily have to discuss them today. Uh, and I think uh, one thing that maybe we can spend two minutes on, if, if that's okay, John, is around, uh, you know, is a faster way, uh, rather than trying to change your own personality gaps, right? Uh, is, is it an option to let other people take decisions for you, right? Is there a way that you say that I will not take any decision whatsoever when it comes to HR or finances, because I know that you're just not uh, good at it. Well, and I think, um, I mean, if you, there's a section on um, in the book, uh, you know, and we'll talk about this in the next section on delegating. Um, you know, you actually, you, you absolutely have to um, do that. But if you're the leader, you know, your um, essence um, still pervades. Um, so so what, you, what you do and how you do it um, still has an impact. I, I think it's obviously less as you go up the, you know, as you get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but yeah, you still have to be quite careful about, about what you do. I mean, you know, I see, I mean, this whole thing I talk about, about software companies, I've seen that in quite large companies, you know, the owners don't, you know, they've obviously done okay. Um, but you know, they, they don't like selling, they can't recruit salespeople. Um, it just, you know, and it permeates throughout the whole business. To answer the question makes sense yeah certainly um i think some of these things are a bit subjective as well i'm sure right and it differs in different situations perhaps but i but i agree in general right i mean i have an anecdote but i'll keep that for another day because it'll take too long um so uh, i just got a message from one of the participants saying that they cannot unmute themselves uh, can somebody just try for me if you can or you cannot. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, Elsa, could you please just check if participants are allowed to, you know, if there's a setting that you need to change? Because because it worked in the start when, you know, uh, people were introducing themselves. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can change that. Uh, I'll work on that, uh, and then John, perhaps you can get started in on the next uh, part. Does everyone have questions, and they haven't been able to put them, or is 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 that what's happening? Yes. Or um, because I can change the sort of timing, really, if you if you want some time for for questions. Okay, let's let's go on then. Okay. Um, I've, I've changed the settings. I'm terribly sorry about that. You know, there were a lot of people entering uh, the room uh, and they were always uh, unmuted when they entered. There was, there was background noise. So we changed the setting uh, and then I think it affected everyone in the room. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. So, um, how do you now? Now, now we've worked out how we're making decisions. How do we apply that to business? Uh, now, this is going to be very brief uh, because probably each of the sections that I'm going to talk about here um, could easily be a, could easily be a one or two day workshop. Um, but what 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 we've done at Axiom um, is put together um, a process um, that you can go through 
Um, it's called the polar process for obvious reasons um, that you can actually um, take what you've learned about decision making and apply that to your business. And, and what it what it really does is it 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 asks you to be completely honest um, when looking at a number of different topics in your in your business. So the polar process, P-O-L-A-R. But the key thing is you need to look at your business with an objective reality. Um, so you need to be totally objective about it. You need to be honest and you need to use, as Ray Dalio says, radical transparency. So <clears throat> the caption there is welcome to reality. Um, but that's where you have to be. And so many companies that I've seen um, and I've worked with a lot of companies over the years. They're just not, they're not in reality. You know, I mean, you just look at them and you go, they're going bust. I mean, it, it starts from, I mean, I, I've been in, <laughs> I've been into businesses who've been trying to sell their companies to me and they say, oh, we want X amount of million. And I sort of in five minutes looked at it and said, well, when are you going bust then? Um, and you know these people are people are on often on a different planet they they just don't understand what objective reality is so what is the polar process so it's for p is position so looking at where where your business is today and we'll we'll, un, we'll unpick um a few of these but but if you want to go anywhere you've got to know where you are you've got to know where you start and you'd be amazed at the number of businesses you go in they haven't got a clue where they are you know they've just been operating happily for years on end it's kind of like drifting and the, they have board meetings where you know not much goes on they all chat about each other's wives and husbands and um make the odd decision and uh, the company's just drifting. They, they don't have a clue where they are. And that's the, C, the CEO's job, or entrepreneur's job, is to know exactly where you are in your business. Um, o is for objectives, which is basically where your business is headed. Um, <clears throat> now, lots of people have some amazing ideas about where they want their business to be headed, but you have to, you know, you have to look realistically um the, all, all we ever hear about is amazon you know you 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 read the papers about maybe 10 companies um that's all that's in your head but the, the whole world is just full of um one two five ten twenty a hundred five hundred people companies that are all just all just getting on that's the, that's a reality of business it isn't at this elon musk level it's it's with, with guys like us actually um that are just kind of getting on with it um and, and you know you have to be realistic about your objectives uh leadership so uh, i mean i've got a bit of a thing about leadership because um <laughs> uh, if you do a search on amazon for leadership books there's sixty thousand, sixty thousand books on leadership on amazon now if you if you put in global warming there's twenty thousand. <laughs> so so we're in this world that's obsessed with leadership i mean how much more can be written about leadership um now leadership's important and vital but it's not you know i mean it isn't an amazing science um so in in the polar process you know we try we try and get real about leadership uh assets now assets are really your people um uh, I mean that you know you might own gold mines, but you don't um, you don't get any gold out of your gold mine without having miners in it digging the gold out. So you know I mean there there, there is always people in any business. Um, so they are key, and how you look after your people is key. And, and you know why do they work for you? Um, and then resilience. I mean, re really, the, the only thing that makes a company successful in inverted commas is the fact that it's solvent and the fact that it's got a long term future, that it's not going to go go bust in the future. I mean, and, and then that's it. Everything else is sort of fluff around the outside. Success is, is it solvent? Can it play its way? And is it 
is it going to survive? And that, you know, that that's success. Um, so uh, we so we focus on those five uh, areas. So I'll just go go over them briefly. I mean, in terms of position, I mean, what 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 you need to look at is your product, where you, sort of how your product sits. Um, is it at the end of does it solve a problem? Um, I mean, there, there's been a number of tech unicorns, um, so they're valued at a billion pound because some idiots have put a million um, enough money to value it at one hundred percent of the equity as a billion. Um, and they've never, ever, ever made a profit, and they, they've gone bust. And the reason is that the product doesn't solve a problem. You know, it's clever, sophisticated, uh, and it, it's wonderful, but most products have to solve some kind of problem, then, so, then someone will buy them. Um, and there's many companies. But when you, when you take a long, hard look um, at whether they solve a problem, they're not going to get... Yeah, you know, and it, it just actually shows that that I mean investors don't have an objective reality. You know, why why does an investment fund put four million into a business that doesn't have a product that's ever going to sell? Because they've been sold to. Um, then another key aspect of position is is money. So where are you with money? I mean, every every CEO a company, no matter what size, should know exactly how much is in the bank today. What's your, what's your cash balance today? Because cash cash is king. It doesn't matter how big your company is. If it runs out of cash, you, you're not going to survive. Um, and you'd be amazed at how many people, you know, you ask them the question, they don't know. They don't know how much money is in their account. Um, and and you know understanding margins and, and basically how you're ma you're making your money and money is the the flow money is the blood flow through a, through a business um, how you sell and how you market your products um, again there's a there's a there's a, um, a process from customers not knowing anything about your products to customers buying your product and there it doesn't matter whether you're selling um, uh, fresh cut flowers or aeroplanes you know it's the, it's the same process that you go through uh, it's become a bit more it's become quite complicated recently because of social media but 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 at the end of the day somebody needs to know about your product before they buy it and then you have to go through a process to buy it and in the in that cycle um if you look realistically you know what are you doing right and what are you doing wrong what are you honestly doing right and doing wrong in that cycle? Um, plenty of people of my age ignore social media. And, you, you know, you haven't got hope if you're not doing social media, but, you know, plenty of people of my age are dead scared of it. Um, now, why is that? They'll go, oh, social media is irrelevant. Um, you know, it's just, it's for kids. Um, that's, that's an inbuilt subconscious bias <laughs> that says I'm scared I'm not going to have I'm not going to have anything to do with it it's just for kids um, and also the, the the sort of position around your the people in your business and your culture um, we've actually got a fascinating little tool um, that that works out where the culture of your business is in in the sort of like cultural cycle um, uh, I mean, <clears throat> and I've used that tool a lot, and I mean, it actually makes people smile when they, because it, it talks about what you, what people say, uh, and what people do when they're in certain cultural phases, um, and uh, 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 and again, looking at things honestly. So, so that's position. Uh, then we need to apply honesty to objectives. Um, and <clears throat> we cover um, what are the real objectives of the business. So if you're looking honestly at a business, you know, they'll tell you, oh, our objectives are to uh, achieve an IPO or to grow by acquisition or, um, 
you know, I mean, I, I, I will honestly say, I mean, I, I had a business where all my partners thought that our objective was to, to um, exit. I was running it and my objective was to buy them all out. Um, and that, that was the real objective of the business. And, and I think most businesses, often what's really going on is hidden. It's not often the management team don't really understand the real objectives of the business. Um, so consequently, you can get businesses that are pulling, pulling each other apart because you've got people heading in different directions because they're, they're trying to achieve things that um, other people maybe don't want to happen. So, and I think you have to be very honest in looking at your business as what the real objectives are. Uh, you know, we cover ownership and management investors. Investors are uh, vital for companies, but they're often trouble. Um, you know, you, you have to be very careful when you're, um, when you're getting investment in uh, that they don't end up controlling you and changing um, what the objectives of the business are. Uh, and actually how, and how you borrow money is um, quite interesting in terms of um, sort of power in a company. Um, we cover taking on this look at purpose and vision. So purpose, purpose is actually a fascinating topic um, and it's become quite trendy. Um, so much so that you get companies that they do, uh, it's called purpose washing. So they'll pay um, a PR organization to define their purpose for them. Um, and part of the issue with that is it obviously isn't their purpose if they've had a PR agency try and define it. So, so the, the company never, fo never follows um, that as a reality. But then there are other businesses um, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's not a business; it's a charity. But cancer research, you know, their their purpose is um, that they want to end up uh, eliminating cancer, um, and everything that they do is heading off in that direction. So, so again, being honest about what your purpose is um, is in, is is key. Um, I know companies where the purpose is the shareholders make as much money as they possibly can. Um, and to be honest, they might as well tell the staff that because it just, you know, it, you know, they're, they're probably sort of going on about how they, you know, their, their objective is to um, give everyone a secure job. It isn't. And, and, you know, it just shows. So, um, and we look at things like strategy and tactics and, and business plans. So leadership is quite an interesting um, area to look at, honestly, because basically, as if you're leading your enterprise, as we say, your enterprise is you. Your, your enterprise is you. So we have to be honest um, when we look at leadership. And plenty of leaders are actually here in their comfort zone. Um, and as we've discussed, you need to get out of your comfort zone um, if you want to actually make any changes. But, you know, just looking at um, things like the responsibilities you have to a business, um, you know, it's, it's honest uh, to realise uh, that sometime in a company, people aren't working. Um, they just don't fit. Um, and, you know, you, it, it's you that owns the culture that says, well, we won't keep those people in the business. Now, now that's a very hard thing to do. No, nobody likes to make people redundant or move them on. Um, but as a leader, you know, you, have, you just have to do it. You have to be brave enough and honest enough uh, to do it because actually every, everybody else in the business is looking at you to achieve that. Um, we, one of the things that we do focus on is luck because there are a million and one, um, there's a million and one 
people that will tell you that luck doesn't exist. They're absolutely wrong. There's absolutely no doubt that luck um, exists in business and in life. And I, I know plenty of business people who um, have been lucky and they'll probably admit it. But I also know plenty of business people who've been lucky, um, but they try and convince themselves that it's all their, all their skill. Um, and you, you, see, you have to factor in luck um into your into your business plans because it will happen um you know some, something or something will happen um that's down to luck uh, something will happen that's down to bad luck i mean you just have to make sure that if, if you get bad luck it's not gonna it's not gonna destroy your enterprise and you have to be aware that if you have good luck you've had good luck i mean let's say you're a bitcoin investor i mean the number of bitcoin investors i know now who are sort of um yeah, check me out. You know, I, you know, I, I really know how to make money, don't I? You know, I, I made that amazing um, decision ten years ago to buy Bitcoin, and they're, you know, they kind of convinced themselves that they're a great investor. I'm sorry that that's luck. But if you, if you, if you bought Bitcoin at I don't know a dollar a Bitcoin and it's now worth sixty thousand dollars, that that was luck. No one knew it was going to get to where it's got to. Um, and then the other thing we talk about is is um, is just be serious about having a good time in business and laughing at things. Uh, and so, at, in terms of being honest, this is one of the the key areas really which is honest about your people um, because they they warrant it um, so it's about having the right people in place uh, about doing the right thing for people um, being honest in why people should work for you um, so actually ask yourself as a business person why should why should people work for our company um you know mo most people say oh it's because we're amazingly successful um you know we like you know people want to work for us because of um uh you know we treat our people best best most people work for you because of money um at the end of the day most people work for you because they're getting paid um, now the interesting thing is that money isn't the actual be all and end all, so they don't have to they don't have to earn the most. But ninety percent of why people go to work um, is because it puts food on the table and they're getting paid. So money pays the bills, you know, provides housing, gives sort of clothes the children. Um, so I think many people underplay the motivation of people who work for you for money, and that, that's a mistake. So I think you need to be honest about that. But then, there's, then, then after that, there's a whole raft of things like convenience and flexibility, responsibility, give people opportunities to be part of something successful, opportunities for growth and development, all those kind of things. But they're all couched in what you're like as a person as a leader and the culture of the company that they work in. So talking about delegation, um, Varun, um, we've got some tips for delegation, um, which I can go through, yeah? So, so, I mean, basically you can't scale a business on your own. Um, which is why you recruit staff and why you recruit freelancers, you know, but basically people working for you. And one of the one of the things that most entrepreneurs are bad at is delegation. Um, and many entrepreneurs are really reluctant to let go. Um, but delegation is is pretty essential because you, I mean you just can't do it all yourself. But so you as you set the culture um, but you have to start delegating. 
So the first thing that you have to do is start to feel uncomfortable again, because you have to understand um, that you don't probably don't want to relinquish control, but you do have to hand tasks to others. Okay, so then you can free up time to concentrate on the things that are best for you. But but the first, the, for most entrepreneurs, delegating is really uncomfortable. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you logically have to sit down and figure out how your team works and who does what best. And that's, that's always different in every different team um, with new people coming in. It, 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 it's, it's always different. Um, that there's no prescribed way of doing that. But get them to take on tasks that they can excel in. Um, and it mo that motivates and engages people if they get do tasks that they can excel in. But at the end of the day, you've got a team. So somehow you have to put your best team onto the pitch. And we, we don't have Manchester, we don't all have a team of Manchester United players doing, if, if you use a soccer metaphor, you know, you basically got to do what you, what you can do with the people that you've got in front of you. And then, then basically you have to let people, you have to give them all the tools that they can, that they need to do the job. Yeah. Uh, and that includes training, et cetera. Um, but the key thing is set outcomes. So don't set pro, don't say you have to do it this way. Just say, um, this is the outcome we want. Um, because that then lets people, and that they'll probably do it better than you actually. Um, you know, if you give them give them the rope to um, to be able to set an outcome, so you you set an outcome, and they then they decide what to do it, how to do it, and so encourage new ideas and approaches, and then communicate with them a lot. So so don't just leave them to do it; just communicate with them, and then that you start to get sort of mutual trust, and then remember that you're the leader, yeah. So put yourself in their shoes and wonder what it feels like working for you. And that's, I think that's actually quite difficult to do. Yeah. And then there's an old adage, isn't there? No one remembers what you say, but they always remember how you made them feel. So you can say, oh, you did a good job there and you make them feel like they're, they're absolutely pants. And, uh, and that happens a lot. But you can, you know, if you if you make them feel good about themselves, it's it's, it's not to do with words; it's to do with feelings again, isn't it? So, um, so that's assets, and then that's and then the, the the other section we look at is resilience, which again looks at culture because you have to build, um, be honest about building a resilient culture. And m most companies go through cycles, um, so they they basically when they're doing well, they become complacent. So the company's doing well, becomes complacent. Then it moves around to denial. So everyone's denying the fact that they're, that things are starting to go wrong. Then, then everything starts to get really confused. Um, and then, then you either go bust um, or you um, move up to start looking at things and renewing things and, there, and, and there, there's a cycle um, and if you look honestly honestly into your business um, and try and work, work out where you are in that cycle it's fascinating absolutely fascinating because you quite often find well certainly in successful companies complacency all over the place um, so again, we look at uh, things like diversification, competitive strategy. That's fascinating. I mean, we could do a whole session on competitive strategy um, just on its own, but I'm just flicking through the book, trying to pick up the, uh, the topic. Yeah. So basically most companies, um, any market leading company, um, must be in terms of disciplines of operations, product, or customer intimacy. Um, market leaders uh, are normally 
um, excellent in all three of those areas. So operations, so the objective is to be the lowest cost and the most efficient provider in the industry. Um, so each customer receives a high and consistent level of service. Um, measuring performance is a key aspect. So examples are like people like McDonald's uh, and Amazon. Then you have product focused companies. Um, so the idea is to have the best and most desirable product. So people like Apple, BMW, and then people like who just look after their customers. So they have customer intimacy. Um, so people like IBM and Accenture, those types of organizations are key on those. So if you can get your business to be excellent in all three, um, there's a possibility that you might end up as a market leader. If you don't do well in any of those three, you probably won't survive. Um, so again, it's quite interesting to look at your own business and see what you're good at. And quite often that what you're good at reflects the um, reflects the your own personality. So if you're good with customers, you end up with a, cu a business that has customer intimacy. If you um, if you're logical and organised, you end up with a company that is good at operations. Um, if you like sort of tinkering about with product and developing software, or you're an engineer, you often end up with a company that's a product product kind of led business. So, um, and also we look at. Uh, borrowing from investors and things like AI and robotics, which is increasingly coming to the fore. And, uh, and again, people uh, um, of my, my generation and ilk um, are pretty scared of AI and robotics, but that is that AI is going to completely transform um, the business landscape in the next 20 years. And if, if, you, if you're scared of that, um, you might as well forget it. You might as well give up and sell your company or, or, or move on somewhere else because it's, it's going to be vital. So um, that was a bit of a, um, it, it's quite difficult to actually do a, a work, um, a 45 minute talk on that. But those, those are the kind of things that we cover. Um, in the business, but if you if you apply radical transparency and you apply honesty um, to all those areas of your business, uh, and you can imagine, you can just pick out one of those, and you could have an afternoon on it. How you slowly transform your business. Um, so, if anyone wants to find out more, the whole um, the whole of the polar process is in the book. Uh, that we wrote, um, which is called Against the Odds. Um, it's how to survive and then thrive in business. So that's actually available on Amazon. Um, but I mean, obviously, if you get in touch with us uh, at Axiom, uh, we could get you a copy um, or you can just email me. Um, so I think I am, I finished five minutes early on that. So are there any questions? Any questions or comments, if you'd like? Maybe, maybe one, one okay. question, John. Oh, sorry. So, you, because you, you, you posed a number of questions to or questions to us in each of our sort of five minute bits. <clears throat> but I guess, how, how easy is it for you know, as an individual, to really identify, you know, what your 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 sort of subconscious beliefs. Because obviously you got, as I was doing that in my five minutes, my conscious kept trying to scrub those and tell me everything was okay. I mean, is it, is it, is it just something that you can do yourself? Uh, it, it differs for each individual, doesn't it? But uh, I mean, I think the thing to make sure is you're not scared of it. Um, because, you know, stuff can come up. Um, that you find very uncomfortable. So um, I, I, how easy is it? I, I can't answer that question. It's, it's easier for some than others. Um, I mean, I, I think I could say that it took me, well, six, six years of um, plodding away, 
putting man holding a sledge and thinking about it. Um, and, you know, a, probably a dozen years of maybe more than that business experience before I even worked out what was really going on. Um, and I mean, even, even today, personally, you know, there's stuff I know that I don't do because of, of subconscious filters. But the fact that I kind of understand that I don't, don't do that now is quite, I think that's important. I think that's the, I think that's the, the first step, isn't it? So I don't, did that answer the question? Yep. How easy do you find it? Uh, in the five minutes you gave us in between each session, very difficult. But I get, I get, I guess, <clears throat> I get, I guess that wasn't quite enough time. <laughs> yeah, those are very heavy questions uh, uh, as well, John. I think uh, you know one of the one of the things I'm thinking of is, uh, and I wrote it in the chat as well, is that I'm dreading uh, implementing some of your advice, right? Because it's it's going to be very uncomfortable to uh, sort of implement it, but. I mean, I know, again, in my subconscious that we have to, as business leaders, we have to look at what we're doing wrong in our businesses. And we have to understand that, you know, it is, and I completely agree that, you know, it's our personality that, uh, uh, you know, affects uh, our business and our business becomes us, right? Um, I think, I really think, you know, I can take the faster path and, you know, just delegate it completely to someone and put in a practice in which, you know, I absolutely cannot influence their decision, right? I think that could be easier um, because, but, but maybe not. I, yeah, maybe not. And you'd be amazed at how um, powerful your person, you find your personality, personality. I mean, people that, that start businesses are different, aren't they? They're, um, um, I, mean, I, I think you've seen through this whole pandemic that many, most people are quite wanna be led. Um, so I think you'd be surprised that even though you're delegating stuff, uh, how sort of powerful your, um, your aura and your influence is you know, that that again i mean all i can do is speak from my own experience um but entrepreneurs you know they 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 leave legacies don't they you know you look at people like steve jobs um he i'm sure he said he delegated most of his stuff but yeah i think the other sell, it, sell your company because you'll sell your company and your company in five years time will still be you. You know, I mean, I, I've had that. I've bought businesses and I thought, yeah, we'll integrate them in. 10 years later, they've still got their old culture and it's the culture of the people that I booted out after, eight, you know, after, uh, because I, I didn't want them influencing the business. Um, so, okay, you go. Um, and the, you know, the, particularly if it's if it's not in your offices, if it's remote, um, and you go in there ten years later, the culture will still be different. So that that just shows how powerful that that whole thing is. And most most mergers of companies fail because of cultural issues. Um, it's not because the, the products or anything. It's cultural issues. It's merging the cultures. Eighty percent of companies fail because of the cultural issues. Company mergers fail because of cultural issues, and I think it's that. I think uh, I, I also share your views on uh, leadership books and leadership thoughts. Right? Uh, they they don't consider the subconscious, and I I don't think they consider uh, most of them. I'm sure there are some books out there that do consider the subconscious uh, thoughts. Um, I I've also pasted on the chat. Uh, a talk by Ray Dalio that I had heard about seven, eight years back. It's a TED talk and I absolutely loved the thought. And I thought that whenever I set up my company, uh, there will be certain things that I will apply. You've reminded me about it, of course, now. And I'm sure at some level, I, I would have applied it at Consolidon uh, at, at, at my firm. Um, so 
I've pasted that talk on the chat. I'll paste it again if you'd like. Uh, if you don't have the time to read the book or you want, uh, uh, not, not John's book, you have to find the time to read John's book, uh, but Ray Dalio's book. Uh, you can listen to his TED talk uh, before, right? uh, before you decide to read the book. You know, one of the things we like to do, if everyone is okay with it, and I know it's late, at least in Dubai, uh, but uh, if you're okay to switch on your videos for a bit so that we can take a photo for memory and as well as for social media, uh, that would be uh, brilliant. Again, if you're okay with that. And in the meantime, if you have any other questions or comments, uh, we still have about three minutes. So, uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Omar. Uh, thank you, John, and everyone for the interesting uh, session. Uh, my little comment on the subconscious when it comes to decision making. Uh, I wouldn't give it that time frame to go back to the seven years old but uh, I would rather give it to the previous experience. So if you have uh, like uh, a lot of failures in your career, that might affect your decision-making when you are in a key position. You might refer to your uh, closed circle before you take any decision. If you had a very successful uh, decision-making experience and uh, you've been in a successful role, your subconscious will rely on this experience rather than on that age. So my take away on the subconscious is the previous experience rather than the time frame that John reflect on to go that far. So that's it. Yes, thank you for that. I, I agree. I think that um, I mean, all experience is, is relevant and every experience changes you, doesn't it? True. Just one, one thing I wanted to bring up, actually, was the, um, the Pygmalion effects you mentioned, John. Mm -hmm. And not to <clears throat> have it to be underestimated, really. And it wasn't until you mentioned it that I went back through something happened in my life. And it was when I was between 11 and 16 at secondary school. And I went to a, what I would consider now, having been through it with my kids, a poor secondary school. But at the time I didn't know any different. And because I was okay, relatively bright in a, in a poor school, I felt like Superman leaving. I felt like I know I was, I, I could, I could achieve anything because actually I was in the, the top X percent, but in a, in a poor pool, but I didn't know that. Because I felt positive, and when I left school, it was a case of okay, well, I felt literally I could walk into anything and make a difference. But you get other environments where possibly you're in a better school, you aren't in the top X percent, and therefore you're feeling in in, in, in in the same way quite negative about the fact that you can't make a difference because you've underachieved. And it's really interesting to have that ability to have a positive frame of mind and what that enables you to go do or, or, or start from. So. I just wanted to make reference to that because I think it's really powerful, certainly the positive position in the frame of mind. Yeah, I agree. I think it's um, it's almost vital, isn't it? I mean, the school I went to, uh, we used to have we used to have A, B and C, um, and the C uh, kids were viewed as not the clever kids. And they um, were in the porter cabins at the back of the school whereas the A and B kids were in the main school buildings, you know, so in that, you know, they, from a, from a really early age, they were kind of indoctrinated with the fact that they're, you know, they're C, you know, they're C, they're you're around the back, um, you know, and that's in an environment in a society where people are given free education, you know, education was revered. So, and, you know, I, I bet you if you if you checked out how those people have got on in life, I mean, certainly some of them would have done very well, uh, but most right. of them probably wouldn't have had the confidence to um, confidence to get a you know a, a better job or 
So the only other thing I'd like to just quickly raise is that um, I've known John for some time. He mentioned me earlier when he said that you know, he gets hangry and uh, maybe make reference to that. He definitely does. I'd also like to make reference to that. I've got the book. I've read the book, but I also bought the book. So that tells you a lot about John because he's offering it to you guys for, for free, but actually made me pay for it. So um, congratulations I to me. I didn't mention for free. Did I say for free? I thought you said you'd, you'd make get everyone a copy. So I made that was my interpretation. <laughs> so if it's he gets into free, good luck. Your subconscious is. <laughs> I'd recommend it anyway. Thank you, Gordon. Perfect. So we'll quickly take that snap. So if everyone can switch on their videos, uh, put on a smile, <laughs> fix your hair. Like uh, John and I attended a training uh, just recently, a very interesting one uh, with Dr. Wong, of course, John. And, uh, and, and I learned this from him, you know, fix your hair, switch on your videos and one, two, three against the odds. That's what you need to say. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for this. Any other questions uh, or thoughts, comments before we close out? Okay. Thank you so much, John, for your time. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for Thank listening. You. Speak to you soon. Thanks, Warren. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks John. Hi, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Good night.